Hey, everybody. Welcome to uh, Pelgrain Press's uh, One GM, uh, One Player uh, seminar. Uh, we're going to uh, talk a little bit in general terms and then uh, throw it open to questions when we run out of things we always say. Uh, to begin with, I'll introduce myself. I'm Robin D. Laws, writer and game designer, and uh, most pertinent to this panel, the designer of uh, Gumshoe One to One, uh, which is Pelgrane Press's game for, guess what, uh, one GM and one player, uh, which uh, expresses itself in two forms. Uh, one of those forms is Cthulhu Confidential, uh, and the other is uh, Knights Black Agents Solo Ops. Uh, one of my collaborators on Cthulhu Confidential is uh, Ruth Tillman. Ruth, introduce yourself. Hi everyone, I'm Ruth Tillman. I'm um, a librarian and I've been a game designer on various things for Trail of Cthulhu, Dracula Dossier, and uh, Gumshoe One to One. I'm very happy to be joining today. And uh, responsible for Knights Black Agent Solo Ops, we have uh, Gareth Ryder Hanrahan. Hello, yep, yeah, I did uh, Solo Ops. Uh, I've also worked with other smaller one to one projects as a one to one, like, um, sort of, you know, magical investigation thing lurking somewhere in the Pelgrim production queue. The sample, the sample one, got. <laughs> Fair enough. Oh, e and yes. I know, I know what working, you mean. <laughs> and I'm also working on one to one fantasy at the moment. And finally, we have uh, Pelgrim uh, Press uh, publisher. Uh, Managing Director, Grand Poobah, uh, Kat Tobin. <laughs> uh, thanks, Robin. Um, I'm Kat Tobin, and I'm largely here from the more developmental side of one-to-one -one and the, the publishing side of it. And, and also, to, you can speak to being a player. And also, I can speak to being a player as well, yes. I have, I have uh, play-tested both Google Confidential and Nice Black Agent Solo Ops with the respective Authors, um, so yeah. I've so uh, Gumshoe One to One takes a one particular approach to uh, running for one uh, player, uh, and uh, that is based on Gumshoe's history as an investigative game. It's uh, uh, we favor uh, the mystery genres. That's what we do. And so the cha my challenge when designing this game was to come up with a way to make the relatively complex plotting of um, mystery stories which uh, have to make sense at the end uh, and have to make sense in a couple of different directions, uh, work for the uh, uh, one player format. And uh, the main issue there, I thought, was uh, that uh, it is difficult as the GM to improvise because you are uh, on uh, the uh, stage about half of the time and the player is on the stage about half the time and you don't have the luxury of getting to sit back and make things up while the players interact with one another. Um, also, just a lot of GMs uh, like help in uh, uh, having well-thought-out, well-constructed mystery scenarios, whether they're running for one player or for six players, because uh, mysteries are harder to improvise. And as we move along, we will, I think, get to uh, imagining what other genres that don't depend on uh, that level of uh, plotting uh, t or, or not uh, to how that would uh, work. But for the purposes here, I came up with something that is relatively contained where there's a challenge system where when the uh, player, a uh, character does something where it is just as interesting uh, to fail as to succeed. Um, and Gumshoe famously figures that it's never interesting to fail to get information. So there's a separate way of handling investigative skills. But when you're doing something action oriented or something where there could be a fun, a bad result, a fun middling result, and a fun, really great result, uh, it uses a challenge system that lays out for the GM exactly what those three possible results are so that it limits the number of uh, possible uh, strange directions that the story can head off in and ensures that uh, you uh, know kind of basically where things are going uh, while still providing lots of uh, freedom uh, for the player. So uh, Ruth, when you uh, took that framework and designed your uh, Cthulhu Confidential uh, scenarios, 
uh, you took advantage of a couple of things. And one of those is that you can design a character uh, that the, uh, you then assign to the player and you can therefore predict a little more uh, where the story is going and have uh, something uh, more to go on, that a, a story that is tailored for that character, the way that every story normally is tailored for the protagonist. So I wonder if you could talk about the character you created and how you uh, made uh, use of that in terms of something that uh, other GMs can emulate when creating similar characters. Uh, yes, absolutely. So the character I created is Vivian Sinclair. She is um, essentially an investigative journalist. Uh, it's 1930s New York City in a noir style. So investigative journalist is an excellent role that could have her doing anything from being undercover to following her nose in ways that not only um, get her in trouble, but pay off for her in some positive way also in her life. You know, the, um, the, the, sorry, I'm, I'm uh, scrolling through words here, but the, uh, the tension that I found with the character was attempting to choose skills which allowed her to um, engage in certain things on her own, in her own moments and her own terms, and then very reasonably go to sources and do other kinds of uh, external data lookup, as it were, when not in the moment. And I think that was one of the um, slightly more challenging aspects. So, oh, I love that. Someone said that they paid um, as Jennifer Jason Lee as a uh, kind of Vivian Sinclair. So I, what I worked on was what were the key investigative um, abilities that any reporter should have? Understanding certain aspects of having on hand um, interpersonal skills, because those are incredibly important for a reporter, such as oral history and such, because that's the kind of thing where you sit down with a person and get the story out of them. And then thinking about the kind of skills that she might note down at the time, understand at the time, and look up later, perhaps um, architecture would be one, uh, biology. She has a contact who's a professor. And in using it to design scenarios, I was able to put her in kinds of places where she would have to get by on a certain amount of uh, wits and really strong interpersonal skills. And then she would have that breathing space or she wouldn't be so caught up in things that she wouldn't be able to look at um, look things up or look into the history of something or ask questions of her friends about things. And I found that um, even getting her, for example, in one scenario, I had her go undercover, it really works with a strong mix of understanding what, what the character needs to do in the moment and then what she would want to do in the broader, broader picture. And uh, something that I tried to do with my character was give the uh, player at the very beginning a chance to characterize them uh, in addition to what is on the page. Uh, my character, Dex Raymond, is sort of just your um, archetypal LA private detective. Uh, so you don't need a lot of extra bells and whistles for that. But what you do uh, have that the player can sort of decide. So in the first scene, the player decides what Dex's uh, big downfall is because it's a noir story and the possibility of him having a, a personal downfall uh, fits the genre. Now, uh, Gar, when you uh, then took the, the framework and adapted it to the spy thriller vampire action of Night's Black Agents, uh, you, I think, uh, realized that you needed to expand possibility more, that it was more of a challenge uh, given the sorts of things that a spy character uh, does in an, in an action thriller than a noir detective does. Yeah. Um... It's almost like you know, the difference between um, a different approach because spies are much more likely to either take very direct things or escalate matters by blowing stuff up, depending on the nature of the player. Um, so there's sort of the neat bit where, like in, in like, you know, the confidential uh, challenge, where there are like three possible outcomes. Trying to cram a spy scene down or a spy encounter or a spy challenge down to those two outcomes was uh, fairly tricky. So, what I could put there was a system where you could sort of combine 
approaches. You can, um, you can do stunts for various skills. So if you wanted to, uh, say, sneak into a building uh, by like, you know, climbing up the, the skylight and dropping down from the top, you basically be able to draw on your aesthetics to augment your stealth and so forth. And uh, through in lots of bells and whistles where you get like you know, mastery edges to reflect the fact that spies are, or investigations characters, are a lot more competent than humble Cthulhu investigators. Um, the other major changes to the system there were creating the sort of uh, semi-abstract um, trackers for heat and shadow, where basically um, modeling stuff f- from Let's say agents, the uh, multiplayer game where you've got like you have the level of police pursuit um, coming at you, or the uh, powers that burst to do horrible things to you. Um, the conventional approach to that would have been like if you if you control the police, you have a police a, a, like one particular problem which you can then counter and get rid of, or have to live with. Let's like agents because you control with the police so often, it was more useful just to have sort of a rising tracker. And the, but the major thing was basically just writing out the scenarios, which proved tricky because um, detective fiction is nice and linear mostly, but spy stuff needs more twists and uh, basically it involved lots more headaches. It was a very long project. So that's the, the game design and the scenario design side of things. Uh, and now we come to the part about uh, running uh, games, it, uh, it, especially now that we're all uh, sheltering at home. Uh, we may f- have one other person uh, in our uh, sheltering environment, uh, or we may uh, contact uh, people and play uh, remotely, as many people are with multiplayer games as well. Um, but the experience of playing as one player is very different, and it requires you to uh, adjust uh, your GMing as well. And I wonder, Cat, uh, if you could describe the experience uh, for uh, people uh, of how being the only player differs from being one among many. Yeah, definitely. It's um, it's not something that I had done before. Like the very first time I ever played a one GM, one player game was was playtesting Cthulhu Confidential with Robin, and it was just it was not like anything I had ever played before. Um, because you make a lot of assumptions, I think, when you when you play as part of a group of people. Um, you know, you you kind of toss ideas around. You know, you kind of people come up with different perspectives on problems and different options. So I think that as a player, I was really used to having a team of people to kind of brainstorm with and to um, come up with ideas with, and also, you know, not having to always contribute the next, like not having to entirely direct the action and say, well, this is what we're going to do next, and then this is what we're going to do next. Um, and also not be solely responsible for all of the information in the adventure as well. Um, I think that usually when you've got a, a role-playing group, then people tend to remember different aspects of the game. So, you know, if you have a recap or whatever, somebody will say, oh, yeah, and then we spoke to this person, and somebody else will go, oh, and remember we had that fight, and then somebody else will say, oh, and we investigated this item. Um, whereas if you're if you're by yourself, you have to remember all of that. So. Um, I took extensive notes. I have to write everything down anyway. Um, but I was I was kind of going, right, okay, like I really do, if I don't write this down and remember what's happened now, then, you know, the whole adventure could just come to a grinding halt because there's nobody else here to kind of, to reinforce my remembering for me. And there's nobody else here to offer input into what we can do next. And there's nobody else, you know, I can't make a, if, I, if my energy kind of runs a bit low, I can't just kind of sit back and, and take a little bit of a breather while everyone else just chats around the table. You know, as, as Robin said previously, it's usually the spotlight is divided between five or six different people. So it doesn't feel quite as intense. Whereas when there's just two of you, one of you is always talking, right? So the pressure is always either on the GM to perform or on the player to respond and, and to take action and drive the story forward. So I found it a, a really different um, experience. It was a lot more intense um, and a lot more pressurized as well and a lot more personal, um, which was interesting. You know, when you're, again, in a, a group game, if you get into trouble as a player, you know that the others are just going to come and bail you out, right? Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you know, you can count on your team to come and get you. But when you're a sole protagonist, 
nobody's coming to get you. And there's a particular scene in um, in Robin's um, in when in Robin's Dex Raymond adventure in the core Cthulhu Confidential rulebook, where you really it really just brings home the fact that you are alone, you are trapped, and nobody is coming to rescue you. Um, and it's so it's it's a very different it's a very different experience. Yeah, to group play. And, and that's a scene that you could that you could never write into a mm -hmm. multiplayer scenario for precisely that reason is that you can there's all sorts of trouble that protagonist solo protagonists in fiction get into that a group of people would never all get into um, and uh, exactly. it's refreshing as a scenario designer to be able to get the protagonist in that uh, kind of trouble and uh, if you run the same scenario for a bunch of people uh, you there's also an interesting dynamic where you can see how uh, people do things uh, differently each time and so, for example, uh, Simon's uh, uh, version of that character was uh, very um, uh, sort of surly and persnickety, and he uh, took his uh, his time investigating everything in the scenario. Uh, when Ruth played, she was like right to the point, and she was very efficiently uh, got through uh, everything. And uh, uh, but in the end, everyone had that terrible thing happen to them that you would think would not uh, happen to them because uh, you can you can do that in. in this game and the result is something that feels that has a unity to it the way that a novel does that the the stuff that you would cut out from a role-playing session in order to make it a satisfying story which is all the back and forth between the characters arguing about what to do um, and their weird blind alley ways that they go down to for whatever reason are is sort of naturally cut out of the experience of, of running one-to-one -one, which is very satisfying afterwards but as we've been saying uh, something you have to pay attention to uh, during the process because it is very in intense. Uh, Ruth, what uh, tips would you give uh, for being the GM uh, in a, a one uh, player setup? I was just thinking from that that I would start with um, a tip that goes for both I think GMing and uh, writing, which is uh, I was thinking about how much I encountered, particularly in the cozy type mystery, the situation where um, I watched a lot of Miss Fisher's mysteries and you run into cases where she's like accidentally gets stuck and you can hear my dog is running behind me right now um, in the, in the trunk of a car, for example. And then she gets rescued by the police and it's an, Oh gosh, Miss Fisher at it again, you know, moment, which does not work in an empowered Nora character. So I think one of the challenges that you can run into in creating that kind of, um, that kind of tension on the, on the GM side is you want to get the player, but you don't actually want to murder the player. <laughs> well, mostly. So you have to figure out what's a fun way that they can get themselves out of it or have set something up so that they are not being rescued. And that was a uh, surprisingly tricky in ways that, that other players just don't get themselves stuck in uh, multiple players. And I think from the, um, from the GMing side of it, I found um, being, Understanding that repeating myself, um, this can happen in, in larger settings too. You find yourself repeating yourself and whether you're the person who wrote the scenario or you've done a bunch of prep, it can feel a little bit like, oh no, I'm being repetitive. I'm making this game something recursive, but it's really not because they didn't hear it. They didn't notice it. It went in one ear and out the other. They, they remembered it, but they forgot it. So I found it's, it's even more okay to repeat information um, particularly or in the way of prompts, such as um, between scenes, now there's still so-and-so that you haven't yet talked to. Are you interested in doing that or doing this? I it's a, not a great analogy, but perhaps um, some parents might recognize the analogy of, you know, you don't ask a kid what they want for breakfast. You ask them if they want cereal or toast. Um, it's the same kind of... Um, slight guiding to the questions and timing breaks um, being very aware of how many scenes should go before there's a break because the player may not ask for it being very aware of um, that the, the player may need to step back into it's not it's not Viv and the GM anymore it's Christy and Ruth and we're just gonna talk a little bit about the 1930s for a second and then go back into the game those were kinds of fun ways to break character um, and so I think be, just being aware of the ways in which you need to 
stay on top of the pacing, take the breather, uh, be sure to prompt for the breathers, and don't be afraid of repeating yourself. You can always ask the player later, like, am I getting a little too repetitive in these things? You don't want to be force feeding people info, but it really can be that it's just gone out of their data processing part of their brain and they need a reprompt. And so Gar, what would your uh, GMing technique uh, tips be? Uh, yeah, I mean, take a route, it's like you taking breaks and giving the player a chance to sort of review what they know and like, as, it, as you said, like you're in one-to-one, -one, you don't have the rest of the group there to hash out plans and so forth. So it can be useful to give the player a chance to talk to their sources of the contacts in the game, their, their friendly APCs, who won't like you know, help them when the chips are down. They, can, they can't go, in, go into the, the danger with them, but they can uh, sort of po uh, advise on which way to go next or reassure them or if you know, um, remind them of assets they have or advantages they can, they can use. Um, the other thing is basically, in a multiplayer role-playing game, there's a sort of a sort of performative aspect to the group. Like you're, 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 so like you're there to, you feel like you're, 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 when your character's talking, you're aware of the rest of the group being there and you can't, you're not supposed to go off on wild tangents, you're supposed to keep the game moving. Whereas in a one-on-one -on -one game, because they're just you and the GM, it can be more forgiving of either like you know, slowing, slowing pace down quite a bit or breaking into discussions as opposed to having to keep pushing the story forward all the time. Basically, you need to relax into the format. And one thing about prompting uh, players with things that they uh, may have uh, forgotten or uh, that uh, you feel you may need to uh, repeat is you can do that in a way that uh, reinforces the uh, intelligence and awareness of the character so that rather than making well uh, you know Josie he obviously forgot the uh, house up on the hill that I mentioned an hour ago uh, you could uh, you should probably frame that as uh, you know uh, uh, Viv of course uh, recalls and meant to get back to the house up on the hill because as a seasoned uh, journalist uh, she's got her notes and she's checks your notes all the time and sees what's in them. And so that you can uh, present that in a way that uh, underlines the fact that the uh, character is, uh, is present in the story and can observe it directly in a way that players uh, can't. And that the uh, player isn't being uh, dumb for uh, missing a lead or needing to go back and circle back, that that in fact is inherent uh, to the whole uh, process. Um, now, uh, I'm going to uh, open it up to uh, video questions, but we have uh, a chat question to start out with. And uh, Michael asks, I was gonna ask how to unblock players once they get stuck in indecision from knowing they have no backup or second uh, opinions. Uh, and uh, you're worried that you kind of scared the player a bit. So I think this goes again to the issue of, uh, I think I may have started answering that question before I got to it, which is uh, frame it in a way that uh, makes the, uh, underlines how confident and aware uh, the, the character is. And uh, to when the tension of being the only player is uh, getting uh, uh, tight, uh, try and throw in a little something that underlines their competence and their awareness because uh, the, the hard-boiled detective having a bad thing happen to them is you know, all, all in a day's work, right? It's not, it's not a case unless you get knocked unconscious and taken prisoner at least once. Or, you know, that's crucial to information gathering. Uh, uh, Gar, how would you help unblock a player? Right. Oh, sorry. Ruth. Could I go for, uh, yes, I had um, a thought on that too, which I think um, it's a great question. And one of the things that I think could be useful is having sort of a social contract set up before you do this, because again, we all kind of get more of the social contract of the other thing, but saying like, look, you're going to play a player. Um, you know, I discussed in mind the amount of violence that uh, Viv as a female detective experiences um, and discussing that with your player beforehand, but just saying, you know, um, putting it on the table, I would suggest doing it up front and you could, you know, prompt them in ways Robin suggested, but 
Uh, talk up front and say, you know, you're going to get into really tight spots, but like in the genre, there's going to be ways to get yourself out of them. You don't have to be afraid to poke bears, follow, well, don't poke bears, <laughs> follow holes, put on mysterious crowns. You know, there will be things that, um, that come up and just remember that you can also say like, I'm, I'm extremely, you can say at the table, like I'm worried what will happen to my character if I do this. And I can say as the GM, I understand you want to have a quick breather and um, then go for it. And I, you know, we, we will come up with an interesting story. We're doing story. We're not doing like, I savagely destroy this player of yours. Um, So I think, I think sometimes making that social contract a little more, visible could be helpful. I mean, what Robin did with me when I completely panicked and refused to do something was that, well, you know, you know that Mickey Cohen is like 18 years old or something. I don't, probably not quite that old, but has a little gang and isn't that threatening because I was like, Mickey Cohen ain't, ain't talking to him. Not in a million years. Absolutely not. I don't want to die. So I did this myself. And when he did that, I sort of I said, okay, yes, right. Social contract. I can do this but I think making it explicit was especially important for one of my players who's only really played D&D and um, she hadn't gotten into these kind of darker um, riskier scenarios you know she'd had players die but it was like dragon fireball and, and also these uh, a solo character assumes a greater level of competence than people who are used to playing uh, particularly D and D, may be thinking of because even though starting D and D characters are much ro- more robust than they were back but back when I started, you could have four hit points. That didn't get take you very long. Um, but uh, even so, the idea that you are incredibly competent and ready to handle situations, as opposed to you are in a terrifying environment that you have to be smart and cautious about, are things that you're going to want to train a uh, player around. Now, uh, Gar, you let the cat out of the bag a little bit to say that you are working on a fantasy one-to-one. And uh, since I've just been talking about how the uh, assumptions of that genre are very different, uh, I wonder if you could share what your current thoughts are as you work on this of how to adjust for the different assumptions of how uh, uh, competent and powerful uh, a fantasy character would be, or how much freedom a fantasy character typically has. Yeah, I mean, this is all very, very preliminary, I'll say, firstly, because it's still in early stages of development, despite how long I've been working on it, it feels. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, in some ways, fantasy characters are a bit easier because the fantasy genre is basically you are a like you know, greater purple hero going off slaying dragons and waving swords. So there's a lot less apprehension on the part of the players. They're far more willing to charge dungeons and so forth. Um, so the biggest like, changes that I, I, are th- things that I've found so far are basically giving the players more um, more options in a challenge. They, 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 they make more mechanical um, widgets they can deploy to, make, to boost their abilities in times of need. Um, but in the one, to sort of loop back to the question a bit, one thing that this or that um, go to one to one does is it's very very rare for a challenge to kill you outright. It's just been ridiculously foolish. Um, like you, even if you roll into danger and roll very very badly, it, you but you make a problem that will kill you at the end of the adventure if you can't get rid of it, as opposed to like being killed halfway through. It's very hard to actually kill a, a, a one-to-one character outright all of a sudden. Yeah, that, I think that kind of coming back to, to Ruth's point about that as well, um, I think it's really important to to let the player know that up front, right? To say, look, you are no matter how dumb a, a decision you make in this game, you're not going to die in it, right? Okay, you know, possibly you might something might happen at the end and you might die then, but we're going to play out the game and that's how that's going to go. Um, and yeah, just just kind of managing your expectations in terms of, you know, of of you being there to co-create a fun and interesting story rather than being against them. It's not like GMVP. It's not GM versus player. It's like it's you are collaborating on a story. 
And I think framing it in that way, like Ruth said, is, is really, really important. Um, and another thing as well that you can do is you can, if, if somebody is being really indecisive or is afraid of making a decision, like we, we've talked a little bit about um, Mickey Cohen, and nobody wants to talk to Mickey Cohen because he's, he's terrifying. He's literally terrifying. He's a terrifying, terrifying DMC. Um, but if the player is like I certainly did when I was playing it, if they're kind of balking at the necessity of going and doing that thing because it feels scary, then you can always kind of say to them, look, what, what's, what's your goal here? What, what do you want to get out of that? And then say, well, here, is, here are the kind of the possibilities. Here are the risks. Here are the things that might happen. Are you okay with trading those in to achieve this goal? And, and then if or not, you can kind of work out a compromise, basically, that, that uh, results in an interesting uh, and results in an interesting story. And uh, it's, it's important to, to use what is now called the fail forward principle to uh, when designing or improvising challenges to make sure that a failure never results in your being stuck in a situation and a null result. Uh, that uh, and the the way the challenges are set up is it's you know something always happens as a result of all three things. It's not that nothing happens. It's that a, a good thing, a great thing, or a terrible thing happens. But they all have an event to them. They all move you forward uh, into the story. And really, only the player can stop the action by declining to take any of the available options. And that's when you, uh, as we've already discussed, sort of. Uh, talk them through it and uh, find various ways to build their confidence both as the character uh, and uh, the player. Um, so at this point, I thought that we would uh, start opening things up to questions. Someone has already found the put up your hand function, which uh, I believe is in the chat uh, uh, item on the bottom of your bar there. So if you wanna uh, put up your hand, uh, if you have a question, I can acknowledge that. And the first question is from uh, Rick, uh, Dakin. You unmuted me. Hi. Yes. Uh, I use this every day to teach, so I'm well familiar with the raising hand function. Um, have you, I've never done, I've never run one of the one to ones. I've read the rules and, and admired them from afar. Has, have any of you ever played with the sort of choose your own adventure slash, you know, computer game checkpointing? You turn this page and you die, and then you turn the page back and start over again or maybe a limited number of time rewinds or something like that to I, I it is not what one-to-one -one is core about but I wondered if that's something anyone has played around with sort of around the edges as another way of uh, of having that sort of experience but maybe upping you know that danger level it would seem maybe for a slightly more lighthearted experience but I don't know if that's something anyone has played with um, I messed around with them back in the day, and there was a point where I was asked to pitch how to do a contemporary version of those books. And I think they are uh, very useful for uh, the, a GM to sort of look at the model. Uh, if you can then imagine that instead of being restricted to all of the uh, uh, set choices that you would have in uh, just a moment, I didn't get that uh, uh, in that book that uh, you can then have anything come up as a, as a result of what you do. Um, of course, the whole thing of deliberately getting yourself killed to see how that happens and then going backwards is uh, something that if you wanted to build it in, you would have to have some sort of justification in that, you know, you're, uh, you know, God forbid doing a holodeck adventure or, or something like that. I'm actually working on a little bit of a twine game that's, I haven't come up with an ending for yet. And it's really, it's, it's not a full choose your own adventure, but essentially there's, it's a bit with you wake up in a kobold village and you don't know what's happening and you can keep threatening the kobolds and you do event, you can kind of go in a loop where you can go get clang. The mother kobold hits you with a thing. You go down clang and eventually it looks like a little gravestone that pops up. Um, I, I think it's a fun concept, but I think it almost, it may not work as well at the table as it may in some of the other kinds of formats like Twine or yeah, that's that kind what of I Because we're I'm overseeing a bunch of student projects making visual novels at the college where I teach, and a big part of their design is to replay and get the different endings, right? And I don't. And I was wondering if anyone had had an experience like that 
in tabletop where it is, let's redo this scenario from the beginning to see different outcomes. Because like you say, you, you, they could be much more infinite than the 10 that my students are writing or whatever. Uh, well, the, the Gumshoe one-to-one -one system is, is available through a Creative Commons license, and we're hoping people do more with it. So someone needs to do the Groundhog Day uh, version. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> uh, which, of course, the Groundhog Day, it was, it was, there was a Star Trek episode that was Groundhog Day before Groundhog Day. So you wouldn't just be stealing from Groundhog Day. Or the Russian doll one. <laughs> uh, Samuel Tyler, you have a question. Yeah, Gumshoe is easily the system I steal from the most at my table. So I'm wondering if you could save me some time and effort and just tell me what I should steal the most from Gumshoe One to One. I've I've maybe got one. Um, I one thing I really like in a Gumshoe One to One are the ideas of. Um, the three tiers of success, essentially. It's not unlike some of the other systems like Powered by the Apocalypse does similar kinds of things, but um, thinking about how you can do um, a real success, a middling thing where nothing bad happens, but you don't necessarily get everything you want and a um, really terrible consequence um, and being able to kind of stack and hold on to some of these things and have them affect future um, future actions, which also then comes out in the quick shock uh, gumshoe system. I've I found that rather um, a rather fun way to think about overall um, designing. Like just think about three things that could happen because otherwise you can kind of come up with infinite possibilities for oh the person had a really good success on this or a really terrible failure on this and just keep the hold the three things in mind. Um, it, when you're planning out ahead what could happen at this point when they succeed fail or everything else um using that as your like your three little planning principles when you're um spinning out a scenario I've, i found very helpful um the the thing that i would <clears throat> excuse me the thing that i would steal uh, is something we already talked about which is that your character in a solo game can only die uh at the end of the story at a, a dramatically satisfying time because of course if there was a Raymond Chandler novel where Philip Marlowe died partway through and the rest of it was just blank pages or was just people talking about how, well, if Marlowe was still alive, he could solve this problem. Those would both be very unsatisfying. Um, and that's something that you can uh, even borrow in multiplayer, right? That you, uh, you know, if you lose in a fight and you're reduced to zero hit points or whatever it is in whatever game system, that if it is then dumb for you to die at that point, if it seems uh, unsatisfying, that instead you're just grievously wounded and that you have some chance, you know, if you just step on a plate trap in a D&D like game and uh, get blasted by, you know, more uh, fire than the GM expected, it's like, oh no, you're just very badly burned, but you know that uh, the, the, the second burning, uh, which is a famous phenomenon that you suffer when you step, step on this kind of flat, this will happen if you don't get to the end and and get the thing from the wizard that you need. And I think that uh, is one of the ways in which traditionally role-playing is very unlike other forms of narrative, is just often uh, not just surprising out of the blue things can happen, but surprising out of the blue, unsatisfying, stupid things can happen. And that uh, Gumshoe uh, works very hard to prevent that from occurring. And that's that design decision is actually the thing from which everything else in one-to-one uh, -one flows, and also the stuff in Quickshock and the Yellow King role-playing game flows. Yeah, I, th I think I'm um, kind of tying into that. The thing that I would definitely steal from one-to-one -one is um, the more of a narrative outcome from um, from challenges or from tests rather than a mechanical outcome. So rather than saying, oh, you take like, you know, plus two damage or whatever, um, the, the Quickshock system um, that is... Um, used in one-to-one -one says oh you've you know you've got a massive you know bruise on your arm and you know you're gonna have to kind of hold on to it for the next two scenes or whatever so it gives you a much more flavorful um and engaging way of um way of, of dealing with results from um the character's tests i think than um from than conventional gumshoe does so that's definitely something and again you can pull it into multi-party gumshoe it doesn't need to be a it doesn't need to be a one-on-one -on -one thing, but it is, it is super stealable, I think. 
Um, and another thing that I love as well um, are sources, which are your kind of the, the people around you in your life who you can go to. And from a mechanical perspective, they're there to provide you with the investigative abilities, access to investigative abilities that the protagonist character doesn't have. So they're there to kind of round out where you, the rest of a party would would um, have a full complement of abilities. They're there to round out your complement of abilities. But they're also, um, I certainly find when I was playing, they're really, really helpful in terms of providing reassurance and support and ideas and just, um, you know, somebody to, to bounce kind of things off and somebody to check in with. So they're kind of similar to um, sources of stability in Trailer Cthulhu. Uh, but they're, you know, I think, I think that it's a very stealable thing to give players an in-game, like a GMC, like game moderator character that they can connect with and that they actually have a personal relationship with rather than just going to them and saying, hey, give me the clue, thank you, kind of thing. Uh, now, some people uh, watching this, particularly if they're watching the seminar later on YouTube, may be asking themselves, well, I want to do a one-player game, but I'm not necessarily interested in mysteries as much. I might want to do something that is more free-flowing or more picaresque or uh, has uh, doesn't require that level of preparation and could be more um, improvisational. Um, and so, uh, uh, Gar, what uh, sort of tips would you give people to uh, prepare for something where they will be winging it more. What what do they need from, how do they need to adapt a game system if they're, uh, whether they're adapting uh, a gumshoe uh, to remove the investigative aspects or to downscale them or something like D&D? &D. How, what do you need to do in order to uh, create uh, the, the tools you need for a fun uh, one player experience? I mean, the, Core mechanically of one to one is the challenge system, which which gives you cards and you get, for the various consequences, you get edges or problems. So I need to hone the ability to write cards on the fly, which is one option. Or if you're dealing with printed cards or pre-written cards, then the trick is to learn how to basically, if you sort of you sow the seed, you have to harvest it later on. So. If, for example, you have a challenge where you were cursed by, where you were being cursed by a demon, and if you get advanced in it, you manage to bind the demon to yourself, and you can target it later on. And if you get a setback, then the demon has like some hold in your soul and can compel you to do something. You have to have some idea of how you will use those later on in the scenario. So you sort of try to improvise around fixed points. You, you, you know that like, a demon will play some part in the scenario so you urge the player to get there so you can use the cards you prepared earlier and you have some idea of how you will use those cards later on after the demon encounter. So you, you, you don't sort of improvise wildly you improvise within, within like, you know, here, here are the elements I'm going to use in the scenario, I'm not sure what order they'll come up in or how they'll all fit together yet, but I will lead them Specific enough so that I will kind of aim towards them, but generally also not completely tied down. I think that the player's cards in hand also serve as potential um, tie-in points, right? They're a reminder to the player that, oh, I am cursed by a demon, or oh, I have the, the power over this demon. But they're also a thing for the GM. You can be aware of which ones they're holding and um, build around that. It's much lighter in scenario design because you control so much of it. But I think uh, from what Gar's saying, when I GM more free-flowing or more open investigation type of games, I like to keep at least notes on the the points that are coming up, the the themes, and I think that using your card or your kind of point in space allows you to build your sandbox, um, populate your sandbox with dinosaurs. You, you're creating your, your particular dinosaurs, and there's a herd of Stegosauruses and some Brontosauruses, but there aren't any T-Rexes, so you're, you're planning your game around those, not your T-Rexes. Um, and if you're adapting a completely other game, look at the things that the system assumes a group will be able to do and uh, remove those from the equation. So, for example, uh, if you're running a sort of a D&D inspired F20 game with just a wizard, uh, you have to 
take out all of the threats that would normally kill a wizard by himself in a regular multiplayer game. So the, the rules system is set up to assume that there are basically you know, linebackers to, to block uh, the wizard from being uh, hit while he does his wizardly thing. So you may want to say, well, okay, in this version of the game, uh, being jostled while you uh, cast a spell is no problem. And uh, you may be, uh, you know, a wizard who's also kind of good at Kung Fu or, or whatever it is so that you uh, have a survivable uh, character and then also design the uh, scenario so that if you have a thief, that the problems that you need to solve while you're there are all thief problems or problems that you can go and get help and then go back into the adventure for so that if you have an adventure that requires the casting of a spell, you give the thief uh, the opportunity to pick up a scroll from his wizard buddy um, and, uh, and so forth. Um, so we're uh, coming up uh, to, the, uh, to the top of the hour, uh, and that means we're coming up on plugs time. And Kat, until May 18th, uh, there's an amazing deal available. <laughs> um, yes, uh, there absolutely is. If you're interested in picking up um, Cthulhu Confidential or, uh, or Cthulhu Mythos one-to-one -one game, or Knights Black Agent Solo Ops, which is our Knights Black Agents modern day spies versus vampires game, at a ridiculously bargain price, um, it's available. They both are available on the bundle of holding um, until the 18th of May. So I'll pop the link in the notes here just in case anyone's missed it we have been talking about it in various places but it's always good to know good to mention it again um now uh, i'm going to require you to multitask here uh, while you're while you're typing in the link um uh, there are some other one-to-one -one things in development uh is there anything you can hint about um so yeah i, I think it, We'll, we'll kind of pass it over to Gar, who's who's just here in this box next to me on my screen, um, to have a chat about one-to-one uh, -one fantasy, which I had totally forgotten was like this big uh, secret <laughs> until right now. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so Gar can chat about one-to-one -one fantasy. Um, I'm also working with a couple of other authors on what are going to be standalone one-to-one -one protagonist characters, settings, and adventures. So the idea is that they'll be much shorter than the existing one-to-one -one book. So they'll be more kind of accessible and approachable for people who are maybe newer to the dungeon or one-to-one. -on -one. um, and there'll be an entirely different, um, entirely new uh, protagonist character, plus a setting for that character, and then a, a character for that character, all kind of bundles up into a, quite a short kind of a little PDF, basically. Um, so things at the moment, um, the one that I'm, I'm the most excited about um, is Paul Stefko is, um, is currently working on um, a one-to-one -one adventure inspired by The Littlest Hobo, if anyone can remember that. So your protagonist character is a dog who basically goes around from town to town, um, you know, meeting up with people and having adventures. Um, so I, I really like that. And Noah Lloyd, our production apprentice, um, is currently working on what he is calling um, Mr. Robot meets the Tooth Fairy, the one-to-one -one setting. Um, and we've got Sarah Saltiel, who's um, done quite a bit on The Yellow King for us, um, is currently working on a kind of a Persephone in the Underworld themed one-to-one -one adventure and hopefully is going to be doing one about the romantic poets as well um, once she's finished with her Persephone one. Um, oh, and uh, Morgan Hua is working on a San Francisco detective one and I haven't seen exactly what he's doing with that yet but it's going to be it's going to be quite interesting he's looking at like a Chinese detective um, in San Francisco in kind of around about the same time period I think as um, as the existing uh, the existing confidential one-to-one -one detectives so there's a lot of there's, we've got a lot of one-to-one -one stuff going on at the moment so Garth spill more beans on uh, on uh, fantasy one-to-one -one. Well, the, the beans are, are still being cooked because I've sort of spent the last while making rules adjustments and working on the sort of the first adventure and see how that works for looping back again. Um, the current plan is that rather than having um, 
sources um, or contacts for identifications, I am going to basically steal from Elric, and each character of the three sample characters has a signature sentient magic item. So the sort of the fighter character has his talking sword, and you also have a companion traveling along with you, a uh, moon drum and Elric. Um, the um, current plan is to have a uh, fighter, wizard, and thief as the three sort of signature characters with an adventure for each of them, and uh, but they, they just can, can be interchangeable. So you can like you, know, you they won't be strongly bound to that character. So you can't take the thief out of the city and send him off on the Bar- Barbarians Wilderness Adventure, which is currently a hex crawl because I want to do a gumshoe hex crawl. Um, and yeah, it is. Uh, has been ticking along between interruptions and, you know, global pandemics. <laughs> um, I haven't nailed down much of the background yet. Um, I'm first sort of thread a path between leaving it as a fairly generic fantasy to entice people into playing F20 games and that's sort of easy in for people who want to introduce um, significant others to D&D-esque games and then hopefully we've got 13th age and doing something slightly more um, weird and gothic, but we'll, uh, I'll find the right path somehow. <laughs> but it is very much in early days, still so far, I'm afraid. It'll be a while before it comes out. Although, uh, now we have a, a core group of people who love Ashen Stars and want to see uh, an Ashen Stars one-to-one. Uh, we are not working on that, but guess what? Uh, Ashen Stars was the uh, setting that began uh, the Gumshoe Community uh, content program. And since uh, one-to-one is one of the things you can play with, uh, we would love for somebody else to do that. Um, and uh, that brings up the, the question of uh, what else we would like to see uh, people do uh, with uh, one-to-one. Ken and I on uh, the podcast recently did a segment on uh, different uh, uh, approaches that we would like to have other people do so that they will exist. Uh, for me, uh, something that I'd really love uh, someone to do is basically just as Gar mentioned, a um, basic police procedural uh, shows to do uh, something that's similar to, you know, the closer or criminal minds or uh, what have you, where uh, you might have a staff of people to draw on to run tests for you while you're interrogating suspects and so on. But something that is, super accessible uh, to uh, someone who might be interested in uh, role-playing with you, but not necessarily deep in the nerd tank that doesn't have the sort of uh, fantastical elements that we often need in order to uh, get uh, gamers interested in things. Uh, Ruth, what did, what would be on your uh, uh, wish list for other people to do for a one-to-one? Well, I desperately want to play a cozy version um... I've toyed with the ideas of writing that. I've come up with my own roadblocks and I don't have the time. So somebody else, please write that because I want to take it, play it, expand it, pillage it, you know, (laughs) sharing IP. Um, So I would love, I would love to to see what somebody could do with something like Miss Fisher or um, uh, Agatha Christie or um, Murder, She Wrote kind of things. The cozy mythos. No, just the plain cozy. You know, because you're in a small English town with a suspicious amount of murder. You're midsummer. The, the cool challenge there is that the character is not in that much danger compared mm-hmm. to yeah. a noir detective and how to make negative consequences of having uh, problem cards that are, you know, you, you, you committed a social faux pas or, you know, <laughs> the, the, the gardening committee is going to expel you if you don't do this or what that would be. And are there exactly. creative ways to solve it which don't necessarily always end up with the same and now you hand the suspect over to the police and job well done great let's go on you know what could a more what could a more creative way to resolve those mysteries look like and I would love to see you do it. Uh, Gar do you have any requests? See I, I don't not that leap off the top of my head but the fascinating thing about the one to one engine is that it's and we can't, I mean, mechanically, you can fit the core rules onto, like, you know, two pages almost. Because basically it's like, you know, you have some abilities, you roll some dice, and you get cards as consequence, or you get consequences from, the, from how you roll. 
And like all the flavour and all the sort of like, you know, heft of the game comes in the fiction and in the taste you put on the cards. So it is a system that can handle like mundane situations or awkward consequences, like just for social stuff, much better because you can put like, you know, as a, as a problem card, you have insulted like, you know, um, Bertie Wooster and must somehow atone. Actually, Ooh, someone's to Jesus Wooster. Aunt Agatha. You've insulted Aunt Agatha. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> you can't pay rent next month. I don't know. Yeah, you, 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 you must atone to Aunt Agatha by getting a cow creamer. Yes. Someone to Jeeves and Wooster. Because then it's the GM play Jeeves. And like, <laughs> it's always fun. I, I feel like that would, I mean, it sounds amazing, but I feel like it would degenerate like super, super quickly into a just like back and forth basically, with no investigation or, or any sort of... Yeah, I, th- I feel like there are some setups that are just going to descend into farce. And is it a fun is. farce? Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah with, with Jeeves, you would get a problem card with if you fail, you get married at the end of the scenario. Oh. <laughs> That's amazing. Which, of course, is always the threat in... in, in That's Britain. actually... Now that you mention it, that's another thing that I would steal from one-to-one is continuity problems. So things that impact the character like in a continuity way, so from adventure to adventure. So you don't just get the impact of something in a particular in, in a particular setting, but it actually continues on until you until the character actually resolves it. So it's not crazy. Sorry, I just remember that. Um and, and I would also love to see someone do uh historical era spy stories uh, do uh, you know Christopher Marlowe as a, as a spy in Elizabethan times as, as he actually was of course turns out half the members of the English literary canon were also spies uh, you know you could uh, do the royal doll uh, uh, seducing Washington society matrons during World War II uh, game uh, uh, there's a, a whole fun series that could be done with that and also uh, to lean into the pressure one to one, a uh, um, scenario in uh, the zombie apocalypse, which of course is all about being alone, and uh, so you've got to run from environment to environment and solve a problem that requires you to learn things uh, while dodging zombies as you move from uh, one uh, to another, and that uh, would be uh, the polar opposite of uh, Jeeves and Worcester or the the cozy genre. Uh, well, I see that we've uh, reached the point. Uh, where if this was a, uh, a, a non-virtual but a in-person convention that the uh, miniatures painters would be uh, knocking on our door, waving to us to tell us to clear the seminar room uh, so they can talk all about uh, uh, different primers and their uh, various uh, capabilities. Uh, so uh, at this point, I would like to uh, very much thank all of our panelists uh, for coming to talk to us and also uh, for everyone here who uh, made us feel not quite so alone by joining us in the chat and asking questions. So uh, thanks uh, very much, everybody. Uh, We're gonna put this up on uh, YouTube if you know someone who uh, would have liked to check it out but uh, had to miss it. So uh, once again, uh, thank you very much. And uh, we hope you join us for more Pelgrane virtual panels.